Uh, so um, something I want to do is like, I mean, there are a few things that we are going to be visiting during the during during the talk. If for some reason there is something that is not clear, uh, as a, as a Carl was mentioning, uh, you can you can write him in the in the chat so we can we can stop for a bit and and, and revisit some uh, something that that needs clarification. So okay, so we are going to be we are going to be talking about a few things about regression, causality, some statistical paradoxes, and other fairy tales. And I hope that by the end of the talk. Uh, this title will 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 make sense to you. Uh, okay, so this is the first slide. Um, so this is a this is a sentence from a from a book that I quite like a lot that I, I write a while ago. There is a movie as well about the, the book that is a hitchhiker guide to the to the galaxy. And what it says is, I checked it very thoroughly, said the computer, and that's quite definitely the answer. I think the problem, to be honest with you, is that you have never actually known what the question is. So I don't know how many of you have written, have read this book or if you have watched the movie, but I totally recommend it. And this is a, about a computer uh, um, answering answering questions, right? But actually what the computer is saying is way more interesting than that. It says, no, I'm not going to answer the computer the, the question. You really have to think about, about the questions that you that you have to make. Um, when we think about explaining the real world, sometimes what we what we find is that um, the questions that we have to make to know about the world are way harder than, than providing the answers. And so we, we, we are going to be discussing to the, uh, uh, today a lot about how to make questions about the questions that we make about the real world. All this is now very combo, and you may be thinking this guy is completely crazy, but I hope this, this, will, this will make sense by, by the end of the, of the, of the talk. So uh, the first thing we are going to do is we are going to visit and revisit some uh, old friends that I'm sure that you all know by now. So I'm sure everyone in the room knows what's a what's a linear regression, and uh, this is the the first thing, one of the first thing that you that you learn when you when you have a course in in data science or statistics. So there is a, a few uh, independent variables x1, xp, one dependent variable, and I want to learn the relationship between between this set of variables. In in other words, I want to explain why with what I know from x1 and xp. Um, I have some some error term, and I can uh, do uh, ordinary least squares and uh, fit the coefficients beta zero, beta beta p. Nothing standard. Uh, first equation in, in most books in, in in a statistical modeling, right? Okay. So um, a few things to mention here. So uh, the first one is this is a linear relationship that we are assuming, and also those uh, those uh, coefficients. I'm, I'm using Greek letters to determine those coefficients. So what I'm going to do during the talk is um, I'm going to have two hats. One is going to be my hats when I do statistics, and the other one is my hats when I do machine learning. And when I do statistics, I'm going to use Greek letters. And when I do machine learning, I'm going to use uh, Latin letters. Okay. So the first thing I can do to make my linear regression model more interesting is to put some prior on the coefficient. And now what I have is a Bayesian linear regression model. When I'm still interested on the value on, on those coefficients, um, but now I can I can I can compute the, the posterior of the betas when I have the data and I combine it with the with the prior that in this case I'm setting to, to a Gaussian, but but can be something different. So nothing special. So the next thing is what we call a Gaussian process. I mean, all of these are Gaussian processes, but the, the most standard form of a, of a Gaussian process is when I assume that there is a nonlinear relationship between the input variables and the output variables, by it, but, uh, and, and we add some, some noise term to that. And then uh, we, we assume that F follows some stochastic process that is a GP with the properties and, and all the theory behind it that you have, you have already studied, right? Another representation of a Gaussian process or a stochastic process is called the Cajun level representation in which what I do, I can represent the Y as a sum of a, as a weighted sum of some functions that transform the input, transform the input variables. What is interesting is about, about this formulation here is that, as, as you can see, I'm using uh, Ws, not betas, because I'm not really interested about those coefficients, because that mapping is induced by the kernel that I'm using. So in a way, I'm building a nonlinear Bayesian regression model in which, instead of specifying explicitly the functions that map the input variables to the outputs, I just generate them via a kernel that I'm using that can be that can be easier to select 
uh, because how we can interpret it in terms of what happens in the in the physics of, of our problem, right? Okay, so these are these are these are regression problems, and I think these are regression uh, methods, and I think we have covered uh, them now. Um, uh, but my question now is, what can we do with a with a with a regression model? Uh, I mean, with a regression model, we can we can do many things. Uh, so in machine learning. Typically, what we do with a regression model is predictions, right? So I have some I have some data. I feed uh, my IGP. I compute the confidence intervals for the for the predictions in points that I haven't observed, like these two points that I'm marking here with two black uh, circles. I make a prediction. I compute the confidence interval. Um, I'm happy about it. And this has many many, many applications, and, and and we use it a lot in machine learning. So it's a lot about prediction, right? Another thing I can do with a regression model is something that you have seen already in the course that I think Carl has explained to you is I can learn about the latent property of the function that I'm fitting, right? So imagine that I'm not interested in prediction, but I'm interested on the location of the minimum of the function that I'm fitting with, a, with my GP. It, this happens, for instance, when you're, when you're doing Bayesian optimization. Um, they, in the same way that you can have a probability model for your function, Based on that probability model, you can compute the induced probability distribution over the minimum, over the, the property that you are, you are interested about. And in this case, this distribution is representing the induced probability distribution over, over the minimum of the function that I'm fitting with, with my JP here. This can be tricky. So the distribution over the minimum doesn't have closed forms. So something I can do to approximate it is to generate samples from the GP, compute the minimum of those samples, and to have an histogram. Over the uh, uh, over the locations of the minimum, and I can recover where the location of the minimum is. Right. So now we we have used a, a, a regression model or a, or a Gaussian process model for two things. First, to make predictions. The second one is to learn about a, a property of the function of interest. And you can do this for the minimum, and you can do this for the integral as well. That's what is called Bayesian quadrature. But you can do other other things as well. Okay. So the third thing that we are going to be focusing on today and uh, what you can use a, reg a regression model for is to estimate a causal effect. And uh, I brought this picture here. I think I think that's a that's a that's a that's a kind of a, a joke of what is correlation versus versus causation. But I think it reflects very well a lot of the things that we are going to say today. We are going to use a regression model to estimate a causal effect. So and ideally, what we want to do is to differentiate when we have a causal effect from when we have a correlation. And when we are going to, 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 to try to use the, 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 reg the regression model for that. So this guy over here thinks, and it's right, that because he's pushing the track, there is an effect on the reaction of the car. The, 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 the track is, is moving forward. This guy over here is doing exactly the same as this guy uh, at, the, at the bottom, but there is no causal effect between what this person on top of the track is doing with the movement of the track. So this is just a way of illustrating causation versus correlation. So there is a correlation between the movement of this person in the circle, and it's actually doing the same as the person that is on the road, but one is really causing the, the track to move forward and the other and the other doesn't. And we are going to see how this relates with uh, uh, how we can, uh, with many things and many paradoxes that we can observe when, when analyzing data, and how we can very easily fool ourselves when using regression models to learn to learn causal to learn causal effects. Okay, so I'm, I have started to talk about causal effect, but I haven't yet defined what a, what a causal effect is. Uh, if if you if you are wondering that, so I'm going to to do that with with an example. So um, so the sentence that I have in this slide is. One of the uh, few formal definitions of what a causal effect is. So imagine that we have two variables, uh, t and y. T is uh, I'm calling it t because I'm I'm going to be talking about treatments and y because they are the responses. So what we say is that t causally affects y if intervening on t changes the distribution of y. Right? Okay. So this is like well t affects y if I push the track then the track moves. Right? And let's let's see what happens. In 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 a in a specific in a specific example. So and this is a, a healthcare example. So I, this, all this is synthetic data that I have uh, prepared to to illustrate my point here. So imagine that you live in a universe in which you have patients and there are only two variables in that universe. One is the dose of a drug that you give to the patients, and the other one is the days of recovery that those patients 
uh, need to stay in the hospital until until they can go home, right? So we have only these two variables. And now uh, the distribution of recovery, if you just look at the data that we have, is basically this blue distribution over here, right? Which is just the, the projection of the points on the on the vertical axis, right? And now we say, okay, what would be the distribution of the points if we take all the patients and we give them a dose uh, that is three? So basically the distribution, you can, you can see my mouse, right? So basically you see the distribution will be something over here. So if we give to all the patients in the population a particular value of the dose, then we'll have a different distribution of the time of recovery. And then the definition holds, right? Because now the distribution for recovery, I mean, we could run a test or whatever, but it's evident that it's different from the, the distribution of recovery given that we administrate to the patient uh, a particular dose is different to the distribution of the recovery itself, right? Okay, um, we are talking about this, and now you you may have already questions like, okay, so this distribution you are using this thing that you are calling do, you are talking about an intervention that you are giving the patients a particular dose, and that's exactly what I'm saying. So I'm, I'm not talking about conditional distributions in this case, because we only have two variables in our universe, what we obtain by setting an experiment and setting the dose to a particular value, and what we observe by computing the conditional of recovery given dose is the same. But in general, this doesn't happen, and we are going to we are going to see to see why. So this is what we have. So in terms of the definition, we have the distribution of recovery is different from the distribution of recovery when, in a hypothetical experiment in which I give to all my patients a particular value of the dose. And we, are, you, we use uh, graphical models to represent this, to represent that dose has an effect, has a causal effect in response, in, in recovery. That means that when I intervene on dose, when I set the value of the dose, I observe a different value of the distribution of, of the recovery. So a few, a few interesting points here. A causal effect is a physical mechanism, right? A causal effect is not a property of the data. It's something that is going to be reflected in the data. But what I want to emphasize here is that it's a physical mechanism. So we are going to see how you can have tons of data about the world that may not represent the physical mechanism. So you need to start uh, thinking about these two different aspects. One thing is the data that you have and the hypothesis that you do about how you model the data. And the other one is the hypothesis that you do about how you believe the, the, the world is working. And it will be the combination of these two, what, 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 of these two, what will allow you to estimate uh, causal effects. So when I'm talking about intervening is running on experiments, is we are, we have, you can think about it as changing the laws of physics, right? So you are changing nature because you are giving uh, the patients a, a different value of the, of, of the dose, a specific value of the dose, right? The do notation, when you see do, this represents an, an experiment that you are running, like setting the dose to three. And what we say before is that in general, and the, the next slide will justify this, the probability of Y given do T running an experiment will be different from observing the result of a, of, of, of a, of a conditional with, uh, with data. And uh, let's see why. Um, um, so imagine now we have another, another drug, right? And now we have the, the same type of experiment, but now we have dose and we have recovery. And now, if we look at the correlation between those of recovery, what we observe is that differently to what we had before, now when we increase the dose, right, what happens is that the days of recovery actually increases, right? So if, if we are a, a, a director of a hospital and we are planning to use this drug to treat some of our patients, we'll probably say, ah, this doesn't look like a good idea, right? Because I increase the dose, I increase the days of recovery. So why would I use this drug, right? But let's see what happens when we look into the data just from a slightly different perspective, right? So what happens if I look at these two are exactly the same data points, but now what I'm doing is I'm stratifying the data that I have by groups of age, right? And when I do that, if I, if I, if I now just focus on patients that have more than 80 years, what I actually see is that when I increase the value of the dose, the days of recovery reduces, right? So the drug has the, the, the effect that is expected and it's actually working for this group of patients. If I go to another group of patients, what we observe is exactly the same. So 
Now we have this paradox here that when we just look at the relationship between dose and response, we don't see an effect or we see an effect that it seems to tell us that the, this drug is not working. But when we do that by group of patients, what we do see is that the, that the drug is working, right? So this is called a confounder. So the H is a confounder in this example. And the reason why we are observing this behavior is because H is simultaneously affecting dose and response. So we can think about a, a, a mechanism in which uh, patients go to the, to the hospital and all their patients are administrated a higher value of the dose because the uh, the 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 disease they have is in is 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 is, is more is more dangerous, right? Is 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 they are in a worse state. So the doctors have a selection mechanism that affects how we select the dose because of the age of the patient, right? And the dose is also going to affect the response because we see that the drug is actually is actually working, right? So this is this is what we call a confounder. So a confounder is a variable that affects the treatment and a variable that also affects the response, right? And now things get very, very interesting here because remember that I mentioned before that running experiments or the do operation in which we look at the data when we fantasize running an experiment and conditionals may be different. And the cases where they are different are cases in which we have confounders affecting the treatment and the response. And let's, let's, let's look into the example, right? So now where, where we are going to do is we are going to reason about three different distributions emerging from, from this data. And we are going to see why this is a causal effect and why just uh, observing the data with dose and response can fool ourselves, right? So we have, first of all, we have the, the, the probability of recovery. The probability of recovery is just the projection of the points of the vertical axis that we had before. So this is this is the probability of recovery, right? And now we have the probability of recovery. If we just look at the data, we forget about H and we compute the conditional. Is the probability of recovery given dose equal to three, right? So this is the probability of recovery given dose equal, equal to three. It will be the conditional over here. We will be this distribution over here, right? Right? So now, and now, and now what, we, I, I, what I want to do is to reason about what would be the distribution of the probability of recovery given do dose x to three. And this is different to the conditional. And the reason why it's different is because we have to imagine an experiment in which we set the value of the dose for all the patients to three. And because we know, and we know this because we have generated the example, that there is a causal effect, that distribution will be the projection in this direction of the points and how they project on this vertical line. So let's think about this group of patients over here that are of are patients that have more than 80 years. If we set the value of the dose for these patients to three, what we will observe will be the projection of these patients on these vertical lines that set the dose to three. Right? And we can do the same for all the patients that we have in the data. The only reason why we can reason about this in this example is because we know that there is an effect, right? We know that it's evident that when we increase the dose, we, we reduce the we reduce the, the we reduce the time they, they spend on, on the hospital. So if we believe that this effect generalizes across the groups, you have to think about the interventional distribution as the projection of those groups in this vertical line over here. This is generalization. You can think about whether it really makes sense to project this over, over that particular value of experiment because we don't have data and naturally this is not going to happen. That's fine because what we are talking about here is about setting the value of the dose where we are forcing nature to do something for us. And we can reason given what we know and we know everything in this example that that will be the projection over the vertical line. So in this case, the probability of a recovery, given that we run that experiment in which we set all the, the value of those for all the patients to three will be this flat line over here. And now we have an example in which the, the marginal of Y, the conditional of Y, and the interventional distribution of the recovery are different. And the reason why in this particular example, the, the conditional distribution and the interventional distribution are, 
different is because age is affecting both. It's affecting dose and response, which makes it different to the to the to the previous example that that we have. So I think this is probably this this idea and this concept of a confounder affecting the treatment, the response, and why the conditional and the interventional are different is probably the 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 most important concept in uh, in in all causal inference. And I just want to stop here. And to make sure that the that this is clear or that that, that you are you are getting the the intuition right about about this. So, Carl, what what do you think? Uh, fantastic. So we we got a question uh, about p recovery about the marginal distribution. Could you could yeah. you highlight that again? Yeah. So the the p y just you have to imagine that you project all your points on the vertical on the vertical axis. And that's the way you recover this distribution over here. So you, you see to, the projection of the points is in that direction. And then you have the probability of recovery. And then there, there is a question from Herbie regarding, can we combine non-causal and causal arrows in a graphical model? And are there difficulties with the interactions of conditionals and the condition, uh, causal variables? So, so when we when we have a causal graph, uh, arrows represent causal effects. So they represent physical mechanisms. The interesting thing about this is if you have a direct acyclic graph, right, then you can think about these models as Bayesian models in the sense that you can factorize, if you have a direct acyclic graph, you can factorize the distribution for uh, the set of variables that you have in components that have to do with the relationship between the variables and their the parents, right? And that's where the causal graphical model takes you to the probability distributions about the variables that you observe and how you can, you can, you can deal with that. But in principle, everything that you represent in a causal graph, it's representing a causal mechanisms. There is a way of connecting that with how you treat probabilistically these models and what do you do with that downstream, but there is a, a lot to say, a lot to say about that. And I'm not going to enter into the details, but there is good reason. It's a very good question. Uh, so we have two questions that I think you will actually come to later on about knowing confounders in your data. And I, th I think this is well, something that will come to later on, but I got one thing that I think is very key on this graph um, to, to get across. And, and that is this thing about why uh, the projection of, if I take the group of 80, why I would project it, how the projection onto the dose uh, three actually happens. And, and I think the, 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 the um, uh, used to re-explaining the idea of this is not data, you are actually fixing the universe. And I think, think uh, exactly. think, uh, um, what have you said in the beginning? You're effectively changing the physics. <laughs> the physics. You are changing the physics. So, so maybe reiterate that one again. Yeah. So you don't have to. Uh, maybe that's not the best way of explaining it. So you don't have to think about a projection of the points in the vertical line. You have to think about because it's not. But what you are doing is that it's not a it's not a property of this data. What you have to do is to think about. Well, imagine that the universe works like the graph that you have in the slide, right? So you have a dose. The dose affects the recovery, and we know how it affects the recovery. That increasing the dose decreases the recovery. That's the that's the mechanism that we know how it works. And then you have a variable that affects both the dose and the recovery. So you have to imagine that what you are doing is you go to your universe, and for all the patients there, you set the value of dose to three. So what that is doing is that when you set the value of dose to three, that's breaking the dependency between age and dose because age doesn't have an effect in those anymore, right? Because you are setting the value. So age has nothing to do anymore about the value of those when you set the value to three, and now those only have an effect in recovery. In, in recovery. And we know because of the physical mechanism that we have implemented to generate this experiment, that what we will observe about the distribution of the recovery, because we are assuming linear causal effects, will be equivalent to the projections of these points in this vertical line in this direction that, that, that uh, the groups are, are hinting. 
right? So this is the way we need to think about this. We are not projecting the points. We are changing a physical mechanism that will make the distribution that we observe when we set the value of the dose to three will be the equivalent to the projection of these points in this vertical line. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah? Cool. Um, fantastic. So, so I'm collecting a couple of other questions regarding this, but I, but I think I think uh, uh, I think it's good to move on awesome. uh, from here, okay. and then then we'll then we'll come back to some of the questions cool. uh, that that's coming. I keep them coming in the chat. Perfect. Cool. Uh, so now you can you can uh, I, I brought this uh, this cartoon. I I really love it. It's, uh, it's about the today's uh, random medical news. I'm sure you. You have heard in the news. Oh, uh, now if you if you drink coffee, that's very healthy for X and Y. And now if you have olive oil in in your meals, that's uh, healthy for this. And then three months later, is olive oil is bad. So uh, we have a lot of so when when we think about uh, uh, the results in in the medical domain, um, we have a lot of contradictions sometimes. And the reason why we have those contradictions is because what we do in the medical domain is try to understand the effects, right? We try to understand why there is a dose having an effect in the response. But what we know is if we are not controlling, if we are not taking into account the right confounders that we have in our problem, then it's very hard to make a statement of how the world works. We can talk about correlations and we can talk about the correlation of these two variables. These two variables are positively correlated, but it happens that the effect of those in response is negative, right? So when we do a machine learning in certain areas like a health, um, in areas in which we try to explain the physical world, as you are doing in the course, what you really want to do is not to explain the correlation between your data. What you really want to do is to explain how the world works. And that's very hard if we don't know all the confounders that we have in our problems. For instance, in this problem over here, I could fool most Self, if I didn't have data about age, because I would think that based on correlation between dose and recovery, I should I should never use this drug when I actually when when it's actually a very effective drug, right? So I, I'm just trying to um, show you how important it is to think about confounders and how can they affect the way we interpret our models and the correlations that that we have in in our data. So this is actually what is called Simpson paradox. Um, and is, it says that a trend that occurs in, in several in different groups of data may disappear or reverse when these groups are, are combined. And this is exactly what we, that we were we were seeing in, in the example that, that I was that I was showing you. I have another example for you. So uh, treatment recovery. This is this is real data actually. Um, and what what this does is this is a study in which we have 700 patients divided in two groups of 350. And we have two treatments for kidney stones, right? Uh, so what we do is you, we treat um, uh, 350 patients with treatment A, and others 350 patients with treatment B. And what we see the uh, success rate of treatment B is 83%, and the success rate of treatment A is 78%. So what we would say like, oh, treatment B is obviously better, right? I'm, I'm curing more, more patients when I apply treatment B. But actually, or let's see what happened when we look into the data in a different way. Now we look into the data and we divide the data in groups of treatments that were applied to small stones and large stones. And now what we see is that when we group this data this way, if we look into the data for small stones, treatment A has actually a higher success rate than treatment B. And interestingly, if we look into patients with large stones, treatment A, also has a, a better outcome than treatment B. So now the question is, which treatment is better? Is better treatment A or is better treatment B? Again, we have the problem that we had before. Now, the size of the stone is a confounder. The size of the stone is affecting which treatment is used and the effect in the output. What is happening here is that doctors are treating more patients that with the smaller stones with treatment B, because the doctors know that treatment B is worse, and for some reason that is maybe less invasive, they are using it with patients with smaller stones. When they have large stones, 
the, the doctors are using treatment A because they know it's better. So there is a mechanism, the assignment of the treatments that is fully in ourselves when, you, when we just look at the aggregated data, right? Again, we have the problem that size of a stone is a confounder between treatment and recovery. And if we don't analyze the data by looking at the size of the stone, we are completely lost on which treatment is better here, right? Um, so the question is, okay, how do we, how do we compute the effect of uh, uh, how do how do we prove that treatment A B? How how do we compute the, the numbers that will tell us which is the, the, the percentage uh, rate of uh, cure patients? So what we have to do is we have to reweight the effect of each treatment by the number of cases that we have. Because it is unfair here that for large stones I'm treating 263 and here I'm only a treating 80, 87, right? So all you have to do is to compute the conditionals and to weigh them by the marginals of the different values of the of the confounders. And if you do that, what you actually see is so when you when you weight the effect of a treatment by the number of cases, what you actually see is that treatment A is better than treatment B, right? But this is this is all you are doing. What is interesting is look at this. What we are recovering here is the interventional distribution, right? So what we are recovering by computing and by weighting by the size of the stone is the value that an experiment will give us if we were setting the treatments for all the patients. And the interesting part of all this is that we are computing that with observational data, which is great because what we can do here is we can fantasize about an experiment that we cannot run. And we can fantasize about that experiment using observational data. And this is all the magic of causal inference is that I want to know about the real world. I would like to run that experiment and I can. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use data and the observational distributions that I get from those data to find a way to fantasize or to emulate the result of an experiment. And this is all we are, this is all we are doing here with a, with a, with a very simple, with a very simple example. Um, so how do we generalize this? This is a very simple example in which we have a treatment, an effect, and we have one confounder, right? But you can imagine having a discrete variable, you can imagine having continuous variables, you can imagine having confounders that are multivariate confounder. So this is what is called the general adjustment formula. So if you want to compute the causal effect between a treatment and a response, all you have to do is to reweight the values of the conditionals by the probability of the confounders that you have. So you see this formula here is basically a generalization of what we have computing here, which has a clear explanation for the example, because we're ever waiting by the number of cases, but in general, it was we have confounders. And it really depends. If we have confounders that are um, discrete, we just sum about the values of the confounders. If we have confounders that are continuous, we have to compute this integral. And now, that this is what I was saying before. Now we can compute uh, causal effects with observational data. The only thing we need to do is to compute this integral. But this integral can be very, very hard because of two reasons. First, it can be a multivariate integral. So it can be quite high dimensional and we'll have all the computational problems to do that. But also the main problem is that it's very hard to know if we are using all the confounders that we that, 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 that we have in the data. And now there is this thing, right? It's like, okay, so if I, I have observational data, um, I have a lot of variables in my, in my, in my data set. Um, so if I don't know if something is a confounder or not, I'm going to go and I'm going to drop all my, I'm going to deconfound by everything I have. I'm going to throw everything in and compute the causal effect. Is, it, is that a good idea? I'm going to prove that that's a terrible idea. So this thing of, I'm going to try to deconfound but everything I have no idea about, and I put it in my regression model, I'm going to show you that that can be very, very dangerous. And this is why it's been dangerous. This is called the Bergson paradox. And what it says is two independent events, A and B, may become dependent when I condition on a common effect. And what is called a collider, right? So let's see this example. So imagine that I have a hospital, right? And I have patients with respiratory disease and bone disease, right? These two diseases are 
independent. So we know that having a bone disease doesn't affect uh, uh, the probability of having a respiratory disease and the other way around, right? So if we just look at the uh, conditional and the marginals of the two diseases in the general population, ignoring whether this patient had been in the hospital or not, what we actually see is what we expect to see is the probability of bone disease, given that I run an experiment and I force people to have a respiratory disease, which is an idealization, that's something that we can do, but we know that because these two diseases are independent, this would be the same as the probability of having a bone disease, right? So nothing is really happening. So there is no causal effect between bone disease and respiratory disease, and that's also reflected in, in our figure, right? But what happens if I condition on hospitalization? If I condition on hospitalization, what is happening is that now the probability of respiratory disease condition on ha having a bone disease changes for the two different groups. So for patients that have been in the hospital, now these variables are correlated when they were not before. And why is that? Because if you have been in this hospital, probably what happens is that you have many diseases. Your health condition is very bad. So you are going to find correlations between having a bone disease, a respiratory disease, but because you are conditioning on, on, on being in the hospital. So that means that if we try to deconfound and when we try to compute a causal effect between bone and disease, and we include hospitalization as a potential confounder, what is happening is that we will see a causal effect when the effect doesn't exist. So this practice of throwing all my data in, to, in my regression model and try to interpret it is terrible because if I'm including a collider as a potential confounder, or in other words, a variable that is affected by both the treatment and the response for which I want to compute the effect, I'm going to fool myself again. So, that means that the only thing that we need to include to deconfound are confounders or potential confounders. And we have to be very careful about, about, about how to do that. So just to wrap up a bit. Um, so if I, if I want to compute a causal effect and I can run experiments, things are very easy. I just go, I change the world, I observe what happens, and I compute the causal effect, right? If I cannot run experiments and I only have observational data, there are things that we can do. There is some hope, but things can be tricky. And we really need to think about the problem. First, we need to think about what is the causal relationship of interest very specifically. Something that helps a lot is to think about what experiment could capture the causal effect of interest. And by doing that, we can draw a causal graph in which we say, well, if we run an experiment in this variable, we are going to break the dependency with these variables of the problem, and we are going to compute the effect. And we can clearly see the path to compute the effect. It's, it's, all, it's a lot about questioning our hypotheses, uh, discussing them with, with experts, and representing them in a, in a graph that could help us to, to do that. And then you have two things to do, and these two are orthogonal and independent things. One is to think about your identification strategy. And what I'm saying about that is you need to think about which are the confounders of your problem. That is independent and orthogonal to the statistical assumptions that you make when you build your models. When you do causal inference, you have to do both, and you have to do both of them independently. Because if you don't reason correctly about the confounders, doesn't matter what statistical inference you are doing, you are going to do it wrong. And obviously, you have the right confounders, but you have a model that is very bad, you are going to have issues estimating the effects as well, right? Okay, so I'm going to jump into, how, how long do we have? How are we doing with time? Uh, ah, 45. Um, I think it would take me another 10 minutes. Is that, is that fine, Carl? Cool. Okay, so uh, let's uh, let's come back to the to the first part of the talk in which we'd say, okay, we had a, a regression. Uh, we have causality, but let's link the two, like, the two of them. How do I use my regression model to estimate a causal effect. So imagine that what you want to do is to compute what is called the overage treatment effect. Imagine that you have one variable that is response, that is Y. You have set uh, that is a confounder. In this case, it's a univariate confounder, and you have some treatment, right? And computing the overage treatment effect is computing the expectation of Y given do T equal to one. 
minus y given do t equal to 2. So this would be equivalent as going to the universe and say, well, I'm going to compute the expectation of y. When I run an experiment in which I set t equal to t1, I run an experiment in which I say set t equal to t2, and I compute the difference. If you think this is very sim similar to what we do when we do hypothesis testing in statistics, right? But now we are, and, and when we can run experiments, uh, uh, this is this is trivial. We just need to compare these two means and see if they are equal to C or not. But well, we are we cannot run the experiment, so we are going to compute this difference using a causal inference, right? And observational data. So first step to use regression to do causal inference identification. So you need to find all observed confounders in your problem or substitute confounders, right? So imagine that you have a, a confounder that is multivariate. Uh, but you can you can reduce dimensionality, right? That the that the things are correlated in the confounder, right? So you can have a multivariate confounder. You can do PCA the dimensionality reduction and use it as a substituted confounder. All those things you can do. But in this example, we only have one confounder that is one variable. So we need to find set, right? Once we have find set, the second point is estimation. We need to build a regression model in which we use the confounder, the treatment to model the uh, the response, right? So in this case, you can do it with linear regression. And with linear regression, you would do this, the expectation of y given t and z will be something like this. And look what I'm doing here. What I'm saying is like, I don't really care about the values of the parameters for the for the for for the for this term. I don't care about the values of the parameters for the confounder. I only care about the value of the parameter for the treatment, right? So now I have a combination of the two. At the beginning, remember, I had Greek letters for all the parameters in a regression. My, that's my statistics hat. I have omegas for the weights of the Gaussian process that my machine learning had. But now it's something in between, because I don't really care the, about this Nusan parameter. I don't really care about the value of this parameter here. But I do care about the value of this parameter for the treatment. And I, I will tell you why. Because this is actually going to represent the Gaussian Effect in the linear model. Or, but but we are we are computing the expectation, right? So the expectation for a Gaussian process will be the mean of the of the Gaussian process, and you all know how, how to compute that. So I'm not putting the formula here, right? So two steps. First step identification. We have the identified set or confounder. Second, we have built a regression model with confounders and treatment, and we estimate the outcome. The third one is just to apply the adjustment formula that I mentioned before. All we need to do is to compute the expectation of the mean of the Gaussian process in which we set the value to the uh, value of the treatment in which we would like to run an experiment. So all this is, is very simple in practice. All you need to do is this is the mean of your Gaussian process. So when you make predictions with the mean, you set for the treatment, you set all the all the values to the to the to the value of the of the treatment you would like to run an experiment for, and you compute the average. This is the step in which you compute the expectation empirically for the population and the data that you have over the rest of the data that you have. So mathematically, well, uh, when you represent this in the in the, in the computer, in Python or, or in R or whatever you use, this is very simple. You just take the data set, you set the column of the treatment to the value that you want to do, you make predictions for all the rows, you compute the average, that's the do operation with any regression model, in this case, for a Gaussian process. In this case, because we want to compute the difference between the effect for T1 and T2, this is all we need to do, is to compute the mean for all the, all the, all the population. Obviously, this is a rough estimate. This is going to have a lot of bias. There is a lot of things that you can do about that. But in a sense, to deconfound by set, this is, this is all you need to do. And now, this is a fun fact. If you do that for a linear regression model, then the expectation of y given do of t is tau times the value of t1. If you are interested in doing sensitivity analysis on the causal effect, in a regression model, the derivative of the effect with respect to the value of t is the coefficient of the linear regression model. So that's why people use this a lot, linear, regress, linear models to do causality. Because if you have the right confounders in the model, the coefficient that you have in the linear regression model is the derivative of the of the effect. So that's why they are super useful to, to compute this, uh, this this type of things. So 
uh, before finishing code. Okay, okay, so this is all, all this is cool, right? So now we can now we can emulate the experiment without experimentation. Wow, learning how the world works, not just to describe it. And the cool thing is that we can do all this with a with a Gaussian process by simply using this formula that we have over here. Uh, so all oh, this is great, but before finishing the lecture, I want to tell you some some fairy tales that I hope now make sense after everything what I have said. So the first one is, oh, I'm a I'm a data scientist. So to understand the effect of T and Y, all I need is more data points. So give me more data points, and I will solve your problem. That's false, because identification and estimation and orthogonal steps. So it doesn't really matter if you give me 100, 1,000, or 1 billion data points of those I'm recovering. If I don't have the H, and I haven't identified H as a confounder, I will never be able to compute the effect of those in response. Even if I have the exact distribution of P of those recovery, I will never be able to compute the effect. So that's why I was saying at the beginning that a causal effect is a it's a property of the world, it's a mechanism, it's not a property of the data. And that's why correlation is not causation. The exact probability distribution of those and response will never tell me which is the effect of those, uh, those, uh, of, uh, of those in, in recovery, if I don't deconfound and if I don't bring that structural information about the problem in, in, in the estimation of effects. So this is the first fairy tale. All I need is more data. That's false when we do inference and we want to learn about the, the real world. The second fairy tale is to estimate an effect. This is fine. Is I just used all my variables in the problem. So do this hypothesis-free inference in which you take everything, you put it in a model, make predictions, and you interpret what is happening. That's false. If I'm putting a collider in a regression model when I want to compute an effect between the treatment and the response, I'm going to fool myself. In the same way, in the same way, I was fooling myself when I was trying to compute the effect between bone and disease and respiratory disease when I was conditioning on hospitalization. That is wrong. We only need to have in our model those things that are confounders. If we include a collider in the regression model, we are going to make ourselves think that, or we can potentially make ourselves think that we have an effect when we don't really have an effect. So this practice of using everything is not the right thing to do when we are doing causal effect. It may be the right thing to do when you do when you want to do predictions, but not when you want to explain what is happening in, in, in nature. The third one is I can do hypothesis-free causal inference. And this is a fairy tale, this is a Swedish fairy tale. This is the, the one I put here for uh, for, for Carl. Uh, this is also false because I have a, as I have shown you, making a causal inference always involves making causal assumptions. And those causal assumptions come through the identification that you are doing in your problem. What confounders am I using, right? And in the example that we have been seeing, identification strategies were trivial. They were very, very simple, but you can imagine a system with a lot of nodes that are interconnected, many causal effects. If you want to do that in complex systems, like this is an example in, in health where you have a state in aspirin, and, uh, and the effect in, 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 the, in the presence of some antigen and uh, how, how much cancer affects that. So you can have very complex problems in which you want to identify which are the causal effects. You will need the calculus and you will need other, other, other tools that we don't have time to, to, to discuss today. So the last fairy tale is uh, all the validation I need to do, I can do it with my data set. And this is also false. Because when we do causal, no one is going to tell you unless it's a, it's a complete expert. And in some cases, that can be the case, but it's, it's, it's a minimal number of cases that you are using the right confounders, right? So, and this is what, the, what we call the unknown unknowns, right? So you can always have endless discussions about whether you are missing or not other confounders that you haven't observed or that you, you haven't considered, right? So to validate an effect, you can be happy with expert knowledge telling you, okay, yeah, I, I, I agree that that's the case, but ideally what you would like to do is to externally validate your effect. 
this is not about training tests, making predictions and see that I can predict. You need something that you need something external, you need another data set or you need an, a, an experiment to, to do that. And um, I think that, uh, that's it. Fantastic. So, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop the recording.